know, I really like the way God operates. He's got this economy that seems to work when all other economies fail. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Well, <laughs> the, the reality is, is that the things that were supposed to work against him, he uses for himself. The things that work for him, he uses for himself. As a matter of fact, just about everything he uses for himself. I like those kind of odds. <laughs> it seems that God is able to turn anything around and use it for his glory. It amazes me that way. You know, you get these people that think, oh, well, you know, they're going to thwart God's plans or they're going to, you know, somehow do something to cause people to fall away or to fail and really what they're doing is they're strengthening the people that were weak and they become stronger because God uses those things that were conflict as a teaching methodology to train up his children so that they would be stronger. So then the person who was like out there to lunch really is just kind of being used and they don't know it. Well, thank you, Mr. Conflict. <laughs> Little did you know that God used you. <laughs> or like Satan himself, you know, who thinks, oh, well, watch this, I'll pull a fast one. I'll get them to deny God or to be so violent that they will hate. And sure enough, you know, they'll get, you know, some Christian all wrapped up. Satan will get them into the army or the navy or the marines or some place, you know, and stick them in something like Abu Ghraib, you know, some place where the sinfulness of man comes out and the flesh suddenly rises up and they act like animals and pagans, you know, and do disgusting things, you know, and then they come back to America and get busted for it. And sure enough, the story comes out that they were Christians at one time and somehow they got carried away or messed up and off into a tangent. But then God says, hey, I understand. It was your flesh. I want you to realize that. I'm using your failing to bring you to repentance so that you could know me in a more intimate way. So that in your failure, you will find success. Satan looks at him and goes, what? Are you kidding me? You're going to forgive him? <laughs> <laughs> then he figures, oh, I got it. Let's just kill all the Christians because, you know, if they defend themselves, then they're not living up to what Jesus said and then God will reject them. They're not loving their enemies. And so he goes out and attacks Christians, you know, in violent places. And they get nailed from here, the left, the right, the sideways. And then you come to some place like, you know, a high school in Colorado. Or you get to some other university. Or you get to some, you know, place where, by golly, you know, there's this, this guy breaks out of jail, you know, and he snags a Christian, you know, and drags her around, you know, and she's not a perfect Christian, and obviously neither were all those people that were in the schools, but the weirdest thing happens when they should be worried about their own personal life, and they are, they start doing something different. They start doing witnessing. They start telling their enemy good news. <laughs> Ooh. You mean God turned that situation around too? So you see, I really like the way God's economy works. I think he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. I think, you know, when people are so consumed about what's failing, what's falling, what's doing, and what's acting, and they got to go out and cast out in the name of Jesus, you know, or do this, that, or the other thing, well, you know, God lets them. <laughs> Why not? You know, if they succeed, well, God says, okay, fine, you know, you learn, you know, and kind of lets them go like, most fathers would when children step out on their own. I mean, don't you have a teenager? Haven't you seen them want responsibility? Now I want to go do it now. Haven't you ever seen the prodigal son in your own life, much less than the other people around you? Oh, we're going to go out and do it for God. Then you watch them and you kind of sit back, you know, if you're older like I am, and you kind of go, hmm, let's watch this for a while. And, you know, you wait a year or two, you know, you kind of go, 
Man, am I glad that I've already been through that one. Or you're a mother. Oh boy, don't mothers have the funnest thing to see their children grow up to be like them? Oops. <laughs> Greatest revenge in the world is to watch children, or actually mothers, have children and then watch their children have children. Then they become grandparents and the grandparents look at the children or their grandchildren and they laugh at the mothers because then they go, <laughs> that's what you were like. <laughs> watch this, it's so funny. It's the greatest revenge in the world. Or joy in some ways as you watch the development. You reap what you sow and it passes down through generations. Hoo wee <laughs> Boy does it. But you see, there can be different ways of looking at it. You could look at it from a oh God, they're so disgusting, they're so messed up. <laughs> or you could look at it from God's point of view and it's like, hey, he's gonna work it out. He's gonna work with it. He's gonna change it and rearrange the circumstances so you're gonna learn something from it. You know, you may not like it. it. May have been your own stupidity, like, you know, pardon me, but if you go out and kill someone, you're going to go to jail and suffer the consequences. I hope you don't get the death penalty so that you have a chance to repent, you know, before you die, you know, but if the law says so, well, they'll put you to death, you know. God may forgive you, dependent upon what you and he discuss between each other I pray that it be about Jesus <laughs> and God can forgive you for that but he is the one who does not we we forgive and we allow for grace to be extended and mercy where it should not be extended by our own way of thinking but when God is involved then our way of thinking gets put on the back burner and we let him do what he does best which is the salvation of souls that he created from the beginning of time. He wrote all the names in the Book of Life. Now he may have to blot some out, and it does talk about that, but all these names were written in the Book of Life, which is why you exist. If they weren't, you wouldn't be alive today. So I pray that we all would find God is more in control than we realize. And we just need to watch and see what the Lord will do. Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands. Thy renown went forth among the heathen for thy beauty, for it was perfect through my comeliness which I had put upon thee, saith the Lord God. We all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as the Spirit of the Lord. And the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you, for he is the one who causes you to change. Blessed is everyone that fears the Lord, that walks in his ways, for thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself, and God, even our Father, which hath loved us, has given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. So comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work and word. Isn't that cool? That God is at work in you? That God has it in control? That God is the one doing it? Now, I'll admit, you know, most people, you know, they... They're going to go out and waste a lot of time and effort and energy, you know, doing all these other things. But, you know, even in those things, God takes them because they didn't really kind of, you know, have a handle on it too much. You know, they kind of were more into themselves than they were into God. So they became a football star or they became a basketball star or a worship leader, jock star or some kind of recording artist or whatever. And they were more into themselves about getting all the accolades. Oh, they don't admit it, of course, but let's be real. Come on. Big money, big name. Eh, you know, a little pride enters in. But in that imperfection of their initial reason for going there, then after they get there, God says, okay, now I got your attention. 
Now, you know, it's a little harder for you. So, you know, use where you're at, and I'll take you where I want you to go. So they become, in essence, where they're at, a missionary in what they're doing. So while it may not have been the best of results, because they could have been a missionary in the first place, and God, maybe to some unsaved people, now they're being put in some other circumstances where they're a missionary to their field of interest. The fields are white with harvest, and all you need to do is share and bring them into the kingdom of God. I mean, I would rather hear of, you know, or I, actually I'd rather not hear, but I'd rather see Tim Tebow or somebody like that inviting people to church, you know, and they all going, you know, and sharing and talking, you know, than to see it on TV, you know, because, you know, praying in public, sorry, you know, much as they like to make it out to be some kind of heroic example to set. I don't think we need to pray on a football game or a football field. I'm glad you do, if that's part of your routine that you always do. But if you're praying to be seen a man, especially when cameras are on, you know, I'd, I'd kind of like, you know, ask people to quit talking about it and ask them to quit filming it and to simply give thanks when you want to and pray when you want to. Because it's more important that you be what God wants you to be with as little as you know or as much as you know than to really be seen of men and to become famous and really don't know that much. Because one of the biggest amazing events that was back in the Jesus movement was Bob Dylan got saved! Wow! And he came as part of his spiritual journey to a church, you know, and he was taught up to a degree, and he recorded some phenomenal music and some albums and some really good worship, you know, and he made some very, very strong declarations. And then because there was no real root, no deep roots in him, he fell away. He fell back into Judaism. His spiritual journey, so to speak, went a different direction. So, unfortunately for Bob, you know, he got deceived by the temptations of Chabad and some of the orthodox ways that, and believe me, if you're Jewish, you know what I'm saying. It sounds good, it looks good, and if you weren't religious before, it looks really good, you know, for a while. And then you kind of go, yeah, yeah, yeah not, not there. So, the greatness of this man being saved was all of a sudden crashing down when he no longer was saved. Or was he? You see, we don't know the end result until God finishes the work. Because God is the one who's working in you, on you, with you, and about you. So whatever you're doing today, recording videos, playing Facebook, <laughs> doing a Twitter, being a tweet, doing a text. Try to look at it from a different perspective as God could use it if you don't abuse it. But if he does use it, let it be for his glory and not your own.